Thank you for coming to last for this lecture. I hope I can show you one of the, or some of the interesting highlights from the last 10 years of the Cassini mission and hope to get interest into planetary ring studies, which is a nice proxy or laboratory for solar system formation, exoplanet formation, and it's the only in situ laboratory that we will ever have in the near future. Um, Cassini is uh, currently one of the active missions, NASA missions, in the outer solar system. Um, the spacecraft shown here in a diagram has a wide range of different um, instruments. So there's the remote sensing palette which carries uh, UV, in infrared, uh, visual, all of these imaging sciences. Um, we have a magnetometer boom, we have the radio and plasma subsystem, we have a CDA which is a cosmic dust analyzer, it collects particles and samples them. Uh, what they're made of, where they're coming from, directional of impact, so we can do in situ measurements of them. We have the fields and particles palette, where you do in situ measurements of the plasma field and the magnetosphere, and the four meter high gain antenna, which is primarily used to return the data to Earth. You can also do radio, occ uh, radio occultations, shining radio beams through the atmosphere of Saturn or through the rings, so it has a dual purpose to begin there. On the back side, you can already glimpse the Huygens probe, which was a piggyback ride from the European Space, Ag uh, Space Agency. You see the Huygens probe on the right-hand side here. Here you see it piggybacking on the Cassini orbiter, which was provided by NASA. And the entire range, you see the people for scale, is about the size of a small school bus. So together, both of them weighed something like two and a half tons. With all the hydrazine rocket fuel that was on board as well, it came up to something about six tons. So we needed a heavy-duty rocket to lift the spacecraft off Earth. Um, in October 1979, 1997, <laughs> uh, the week actually I started university, Cassini was launched from the Kennedy Space Center. And instead of, like the Voyagers did before, go directly to Jupiter for a flyby assist and then out to Saturn, we needed two other flyby assists to get enough energy to get us out all the way to Jupiter. So we had one Venus flyby, then another Venus flyby, came back to Earth, and after that we took the kind of more prominent Jupiter flyby bringing us all the way on a seven-year cruise to Saturn. So the prime mission of the Cassini uh, mission started in two, starting in 2004 and was a four-year mission. It arrived shortly after the, um, after the winter solstice on the northern hemisphere and was about to span almost one season. With the first extension to the Equinox mission, we were able to be present in the system almost uh, all through the way to the equinox, meaning that the sun uh, rises above the northern hemisphere. The second extension, the solstice mission, the seven-year extension, and which we're now in the final years of, uh, will bring us all the way to the northern summer solstice. We're currently somewhere in here. We have two more years left for the mission to go until we have this grand finale, which um, very impressive orbits. Uh, close range to the ring systems. And the trajectories and, and the scientific questions that we will answer are essentially like a new mission. So we can it's like running a new mission at the end of the, of the same. So just a few words about the Saturnian system. So Saturn is most well known for its extensive ring system. Um, the planet, the main rings, but there are also dusty rings out here stretching all the way out. It has a wide range of satellites. We're currently counting 62. Um, these are the icy inner Saturnian satellites. These are the larger outer ones out here, a bit larger, and Titan, the biggest one. Titan is actually comparable to Mercury, so if Titan formed somewhere else in the solar system, it would be a planet in its own right. However, it's a moon of Saturn because it formed there. For scale, this picture is to scale. On the left, you see the Earth, the moon. The distance between Earth and moon is to scale. So if you took the entire main system of Saturn, you could fit it right in between the Earth and the Moon. It's about 300,000 kilometers wide, and it's pretty impressive. <coughs> this is the vantage point from Earth. You would have these observations by the Hubble telescope. You see the seasons on Saturn changing. The rings in the equatorial plane change their opening angle as the seasons come and go because the Saturn, uh, the planet is tilted in its orbit. So you can see. But what we never see is the unlit side of the rings. So when Cassini was approaching the system, 
We have a similar vantage point, but we can already glimpse parts of the northern hemisphere that we were not able to see from Earth. We have seen them with voyages years ago. However, it's only an orbiter around Saturn that can yield these. In 2004, we had to perform a 97-minute burn to break. We were too fast. We needed to slow down so that Saturn could capture us and we could go into orbit in Saturn. Uh, this was a very nerve-wracking maneuver. A few minutes less or more of the burn would have sent us on a completely different trajectory and we would have had to find a different mission goal, says them. <laughs> Where could we go next? Saturn's not the target. However, we succeeded, and these are the first rewards. You get the unlit side of, this, of the system. Can we bring down the lights a bit more here in front here? So what you see here in the center is the planet. You see the rings are casting the shadow onto the northern hemisphere. The ring is shining from below through the ring planes. So whatever you see in dark here is denser material or material that is more opaque. It doesn't allow the sunlight to get through, so you can't see. And this is the only thing that you can see with the spacecraft in orbit. This is a different image. It shows clearly differences between the northern and southern hemisphere of the planet. The northern hemisphere is cast in this azure blue color, while the southern hemisphere is the well-known golden color that we knew from Saturn. First of all, we know it from Earth-based observations, but these were also the images that Voyager returned. However, Voyager visited Saturn shortly after Equinox, so the northern and the southern hemisphere were almost equally illuminated, both of them having these kind of golden color. Cassini was there when it was winter, and we see these blue colors. Here's a close-up image showing the rings in front, one of the icy moons orbiting. And as the sun is moving towards equinox, we see the blue color vanish. It will shortly diminish in, in, in strength and it will become the same ochre golden color as the southern hemisphere until the colors are equal. After equinox, this is in 2010, and you can see that the ring shadow is now on the southern hemisphere, not on the northern hemisphere as before. So after equinox, we get more sunlight on the northern hemisphere. You see the colors have kind of equaled out. We were very lucky to see one of those spring storms that occur every 30 years. One orbit of Saturn takes 30 years around the sun. So one Saturn year, spring, every 30 years, you get one of these storms or multiple. We have only seen six of these storms in the past. So we were very lucky to have close-up measurements of this thing. It's a storm system that started with rapid lightning and uh, the clouds, as they are, the cloud top, as it's moving over the storm system, starts dragging, starts dragging out a tail, and the tail will wrap around as the rotation of Saturn comes until the storm catches its own tail, and when then dissipates. So this is the entire storm cycle. We were very happy and lucky to see that in there. Another striking feature on Saturn's northern hemisphere is a vortex system, a six-sided polygon feature, the hexagon. Um, it has been seen by the voyagers before, we knew about it. We will soon know more about it because the northern hemisphere will be in sunlight soon and we'll have more data on that. It's a storm system, it's like a jet stream on Earth. It wraps around, goes around by 220 miles an hour. And at the center of the storm, there's a giant hurricane. This is false color probably. And um, we don't exactly know why the hexagon feature is there, what you're saying to it. And um, we hope that mission end, when we have polar orbits flying all over the northern hemisphere and the poles, we'll get more data to finally know what the whole thing is about. Another feature of Saturn itself is uh, something that also Voyager detected. It's a kilometric radio emission. It's like a pulsar beacon or lighthouse. It comes around with it. As the planet rotates, there's a beacon of radio emission coming around. Voyager 1 and 2 both measured the time and frequency, and they said it's about every 10 hours, 39 minutes, 24 seconds. And we thought, oh, fine, this is great. This is connected to the rotation period of the planet, and we can measure it. That's cool. Cassini arrived, and we were six minutes off. Now, six minutes is so much for a giant planet. If a giant planet slowed down by six minutes or sped up by six minutes, it's a lot of energy that goes into it. So it's not possible. So it couldn't have been connected to the rotation of Saturn. And something else is going on. We still don't know what. We still don't know what it's linked to. And we have measurements of the frequencies from 2004 all the way to 2014 now. And we found that it's not only one emission line, but we have a northern and a southern component that differ roughly in frequency as well. As the Saturn year progresses, we reached equinox, and these two branches seemingly merge. 
Now what at that point we were hoping for or were expecting is, ah, yeah, they just cross over and they nicely make a symmetric pattern, but they didn't. So current ideas are that there was this giant storm that interrupted the pattern, whatever causes this radio, radio emission. Um, has something to do with the upper atmospheres and the storm systems of causing havoc for not two frequencies to very much. Currently, we still don't know the answer to this. We're hoping with the data and the final mission stage to resolve also some of these questions. Now, to move a bit away from Saturn, this is Titan in the background, the largest moon in the system. Um, very early in the mission, the giant milestone was to drop the Huygens probe to land on Titan. And uh, Cassini at one point simply released the probe. The probe was on its way to, to Titan. It was photographed, same as Philae and Rosetta did. They photographed them all the way down. And once we entered the atmosphere, we had a heat shield that burned off. And after the heat shield had burned off, we released the parachute. And the heat shield just dropped to the floor. Um, after a kind of soft landing on Titan, we were able to take all the way down, we were able to take pictures. This is picture scale and altitude. This is very up in the haze where we couldn't see through before. You see formations emerge. You see the ground of the, of the moon, um, mountain ranges all the way down to the floor. This is about 30 kilometers above ground. And this is the final picture taken at the site where Huygens landed. You see pebbles in front of you. And uh, there was a movie animation where you could see the heat from the the Huygens probe evaporating the surrounding materials. You can see kind of like on a hot street, the water is evaporating. It was a bit moving. And from that, we could take spectra, and we know that it's primarily methane, nitrogen. There's also argon, other hydrocarbons. So it's a primordial mix, and we are hoping with future missions, potentially, to find out whether any life could exist. It's in this. It's a different setting, but we also saw with radar observations <coughs> from Cassini then, we saw river channels something that looks like coastlines. So we're thinking that there are lakes on Titan, there are river channels, there's methane that evaporates, and it rains down. So methane is the same as water here on Earth. It undergoes the same cycles. It can freeze, it can evaporate, it can form clouds, it can rain down, it can flow. And we see the same patterns as on Earth, erosion structures. This is the outermost moon, <coughs> outermost larger moon of uh, Saturn. This is Phoebe. Phoebe is in retrograde orbit, so while all other moons go into the same direction, Phoebe goes the other way around. And we think it's a, cap uh, it's a, it's a captured Kuiper Belt object. Um, being bombarded, same as other moons that don't, don't have an atmosphere, it releases dust, and the dust will slowly decay in orbit and spiral down into the system. And it will actually coat some of the further inward moons, which is Iapetus. Iapetus always had this two-color dichotomy, which was unexplained previously. And it is our understanding now that the dust that falls in from Phoebe in the orbit will hit the leading hemisphere of Iapetus, coated dark, and then an effect will set in that icy, bright surfaces will reflect more sunlight than dark surfaces. Those dark surfaces will then absorb more heat, and so the dichotomy is even strengthening in color. Iapetus has another interesting feature, which is this equatorial ridge. It's right on the equator. It's about 13 kilometers tall. And um, there are a couple of ideas how it formed, but none of them is conclusive at this point. So there are ideas that it is when Iapetus cooled that it unevenly cooled and the ridge remained. But then again, why would it be only on the equator? And there are other ideas that are similar. But there's another idea that um, Iapetus used to have a ring system or something that then rained down and formed this ridge because it would have been in the equator, but none of them is proven. Now I'd like to move further in. This is an icy satellite in front of, the, in front of Saturn. This is Mimas occulting the F ring, occulted by the F ring. And then there is the famous Enceladus. Enceladus is one of the icy moons. And uh, we knew from Voyager in general before observations. Uh, that it is a very bright moon. We knew about the E-ring of Saturn, which is a dusty ring, and Enceladus is right in the middle of it. So there was always the speculation, Enceladus has something to do with the E-ring and how it's formed. However, we never had good images with Voyager of the South Pole, and so we were never aware of a feature that we now call the tiger stripes. 
um, different measurements from Cassini, the magnetometers, they detected that the magne magnetic field lines diverged at Enceladus, unlike an atmosphereless body. Um, the dust detector detected dust grains where they should not essentially have been. And the temperature mapping showed that these southern poles are very hot regions in contrast to the rest of, of Enceladus. And if you look carefully, you can also see that the northern hemisphere is a crater, meaning that the surface is old, while the southern hemisphere is more smooth. It does have these fissures and fractures, but there are no impact craters. So the surface is somehow reworked, which is a fresher surface. Something must be going on there. And indeed, we found active cryovolcanism. There are water spouts, essentially, shooting out water and small dust particles coming out of these vents. There are more than hundreds of them shooting out particles at the southern pole. And you can see here the belief is there is a subterranean ocean where water is pushed out through these cracks, sometimes melding, welding them shut, sometimes because of tectonics opening new ones. And they are releasing all of these into the, yeah, into the surroundings. Most of it will rain down onto the surface. Other stuff will escape into the system. And this is how it looks like. This is one of the high phase observations. You can see Enceladus right at the middle. You can see the plume, the southern pole plume. It's a giant spout of particles, and it feeds the extensive E-ring of Saturn. So whenever we are not able to see the E-ring anymore from Earth, we know Enceladus has shut off its power. One of the other highlights is a high phase observation of the rings. So the sun is right behind Saturn. What you see here, the bright arc around the, um, is the sunlight coming through the upper layers of the atmosphere. So essentially you're seeing all sunsets and all sunrises at the same time because you're right behind the planet. The ring system is in high phase, so it's again the unlit side. You see a dark band in here, this is the B ring, this is the densest part of the ring system. And all the brighter parts, these are the dusty rings. It's like a dusty windshield. If you drive into the sun, you won't see anything because forward scattering of the light, the dust will just brighten the dark one. So this is the best way to observe these dusty rings. It's a forward scattering when the sun is right behind. I'd like to move um, topics now from the moons back to the ring system. This is a picture of the A ring. This is the outermost ring system. So from here, the A-ring edge all the way in here. This is where the Cassini division starts. Cassini is also the name of the orbiter because Cassini discovered this, uh, this division. These are different observations. In visible light, the rings would look like this. In radio, we see different bright streaks because they're sensitive to a different particle size. And these are the UV signals. Don't be confused by the red ones. This is just our background. It's line and alpha noise. So it should be black if one made it comparable to these ones. So we see different structures for different sizes, showing that there is size segregation at different locations in the rings as well. Um, Cassini was also able to confirm that in the outer edge of the A-ring, the Keeler gap, there is a small moon embedded creating that gap. We knew about these wiggles around the edge before. We've seen them, but we have never had unambiguous detection of the moon itself within the gap. So Cassini, this is one of the moons that Cassini discovered. And you can nicely see these kind of edge waves um, that are part of the wake effect. I will come back to that in a second. Prominent are also these stripes in here. They look like a record groove. Those are density waves of outer moons. Those are resonant locations with external moons. As they go around, they tug on the ring particles, pulling them into slightly different orbits. And they will trigger the propagation of a wave within the ring plane. It's a density train that moves to the rings. Another move, this is another gap. This is the inner, um, sorry, this is the, the Enke gap. There's another moon embedded in it. The moon is Pan. And aside from the density waves, you can see these kind of arms spiraling there. These are the waves of a moon. So as the moon moves through the ring material, it will tuck on the left and on the right of the particles. Now, since in the ring, saying this, um, that Mercury goes faster around the sun than the Earth, the ring particles for the inward to Saturn moves faster than outward. So if you're on a highway, you're only allowed to overtake on one side, for instance. So the wake pattern that you will see will always be 
on the opposite sides, leading and trailing sides. So imagine like a boat going through water, you get these waves behind, you get a depleted region right behind you, you have the waves, but since the water is moving only from one direction, you have both waves behind you, but if the water was moving two-sided, right side it would move downstream, left side it would move upstream, you would get the pattern in the opposite direction. So this is the same effect. It's just the moon perturbing the ring particles. Uh, there were predictions that uh, small bodies would be embedded in the moons and we would be able to detect them by their patterns that they create in the rings. And actually we did, 2006, some of the high resolution images, we saw small streaks. You may have to squint a bit. Zoom them up. These are something like 50 meter per pixel resolution on the images. These are very small objects on the, on the order of 10 meters in size, the creating these wake patterns that I just showed you from a simulation one. So we know through inno indirect observations that the particles in Saturn rings, this is another shot of other moonlets right here, have really large boulders and they are sometimes up to the size of 500 meters for the largest of them. Now the main ring particles the smaller ones, let's say the average, we think that they are creating these kind of self-gravity structures. So they are shearing, they are the inner ones are moving faster than the outer ones. The shear will create structures and the self-gravity of the particles towards each other will allow them to clump together temporarily, while the shear will always try to disrupt them. So these structures are more prominent the further outward in the ring system you are because the tides are less competing. These are n-body stimulation snapshots, so of these kind of self-gravity structures. These are monosized or um, with particles with size distributions. Just to show you how the particles move in Saturn's rings, this is one of the simulations. I will loop around. So what you see in the center Imagine a line here, and you see the inner part is moving faster, and the outer side is moving down, so it would be moving slower. You're sitting on a particle right here, the left ones are moving by this way, the right ones like this, and you see these structures forming, coming and going all the way around as they come. The simulation starts with an unperturbed system, so it kind of the structure evolves, but it is there within one orbital period. This is a different simulation where the particles are more cohesive, the self-gravity of them is stronger, they have additional forces, and you see that they are clumping up, so they are capable to resist the shear, the tidal shear, and you could form bigger structures. So we're currently trying to understand which structures can form where in the rings and what are the particle properties to that the rings consist of. Well, we know from observations the size ranges, and we have a good idea of the relative sizes because the UV sees different sizes than, than the uh, infrared observations, for instance. Um, so we have an idea of the size distribution, but how exactly it shapes out and whether it's constant or the same in different parts of the rings, that is still to study. So to match these ob uh, the simulations to the observations is not that easy, while other way around it's also not. Now, I wanted to point out what kind of we are at last are doing, one of the groups I'm working with at least. We are working with a um, UV spectrometer, and we have a special part, the stellar occultation port. This is a photometer that simply counts the photons of a star. So if you point Cassini to look at a particular star, and we don't change, Cassini is moving through the space, but we always keep our, our eyes fixed on the star. We count the photons that we receive from the star. As we move through the rings, kind of dissect the rings while still looking at the star, and we will see the star flicker. And by the amount that the starlight diminishes, or is not diminished, we can deduce how much material is blocking the our path. We cannot say anything about the mass, but we can say how opaque the ring is. It's kind of like looking at the underside. And these are the kind of wiggly lines that we get out of it. So this would be we're counting the photons that we see from the star. We are in empty space, we have a star level, this is what we get from the star. And as soon as there is a ring material, the starlight dips. We will see a diminished starlight. Now the F-ring is not particularly dense, 
but as soon as we hit the main rings at the A ring edge, the starlight drops significantly. Then you can see the gaps where the moons are orbiting, and so we move through the rings. We know uh, the, st the statistic distribution of this should be a Poissonian, and from these statistics we can infer certain as uh, properties of the rings, aspects of the rings. And we can, for instance, see if we have one of these wiggly lines, we can basically ride along and say how similar is one count to the next. And if we do that, we can kind of measure through the rings. Now, Cassini has the advantage of being there for a long time, taking multiple observations. So we have different observation angles onto the rings. We see different regions, we have different elevation angles. Sometimes we fly, fly in high, highly inclined orbits around the poles, and we can look straight down onto the rings. Sometimes we look in a very opaque, uh, in a very oblique angle onto the rings. And so the amount of ring material that we cross-sect is different. And from that we can map out structures in the rings. And what you see on this one is a, it's called a 2D autocorrelation. So you correlate your, your signals. These cyan blue lines mean that this is completely different from what you see in the inside. So if you move from here and you move there, you find ring material, ring material, ring, and then emptiness. Same as here, you move through here, ring material, ring material, ring material, emptiness. This would be a typical occultation as you see it, depending on how you cut through the rings. And this is kind of map of the structures, which is what you saw in the simulations before. And if you invert that with certain assumptions, you can actually make a surrogate image of the rings. So this is, if you take the occultations, you make certain uh, theoretical assumptions, you can create this image, and this is what the rings look like in our observations, which is very similar to, to the theoretical understanding of the rings that we had. Now, the resolution of Cassini of these occultations is typically done on the order of tens of meters, and the imaging resolution is typically on the order of a kilometer. This is excellent resolution, however, it is not enough, you always want more. I mean, if the pixel resolution is one kilometer, you always want to see what's in between those two pixels. There's uh, a neat way of increasing the resolution of the occultations, the spatial resolutions of the occultations. So if we, if we look at the scar, the ring material, we are moving through the ring material with our line of sight. Now at the same time, the ring material is moving around Saturn. So we have two different motions. Um, our sampling period, how many photons we count, will also be affected by how much ring material has moved through our field of view. Now, the more ring material it moves through, the lower our resolution will be. If we could minimize this difference of these two motions, we could kind of track individual ring particles. That means mapping Cassini's relative speed projected onto the ring plane to the speed of the ring particles as they move around. If we can minimize that, we can actually increase the resolution, and we actually can do that. There are a few observation opportunities, and we took them. Uh, we will re resolve the rings down to meters in scale. And uh, let me just go back one. So this is just to explain. This is just a schematic view of Saturn and the rings. Some of the moons are, are highlighted. A quotation cut would cut through here, and the highest resolution, radial resolution, you would get at the turnaround point, where you're the further inmost in the rings. And if you could match the speed right there you're in business. This is one of the results. This is again our wiggly photon count curve, how much light you see. And you see essentially that it's just an up and down, an up and down, up and down. The scatter around is the noise that we see in the system. That is normal. And the level that we expect from the star in brightness is this red line. But still, there's this kind of bimodal up and down shape where we have completely opaque regions and completely transparent regions, which is consistent with simulations that we saw before, that there are wake structures, that there's emptiness between, and a very dense conglomeration of particles that will shear out in time. However, we can, we can observe them. And this is, as I said, down to meter scale, so this is the highest resolution of the rings that we have currently. It also tells us that about 30% of the rings is, is empty. So there's just empty space. You could essentially, if it's wide enough, just go through. This is one of the, from the occultation points, one of the most exciting parts in the system. And since the prime mission and everything was going on so well, we would get more excited Equinox. Equinox was the one opportunity to in situ and unambiguously measure the vertical extent of the ring. Otherwise, you always have 
the sun shining from above, the shi sun shining from below, and you never know which shadow was cast. Is it a 3D structure coming out of the rings or not? But if the sun is right edge on onto the rings, anything sticking out of the ring plane will cast a shadow onto the rings. This is a mosaic image taken, uh, stitched together, Saturn, and the only light that shines onto the rings is the light reflected off of Saturn. So the image colors have been stretched. This has been magnified by 10 and this by 60 times to at least see anything. Otherwise, the rings would be completely dark. Saturn is too dim as a reflective light source to see anything. And you see back here some bright edges. This is the outer edge of the F-ring. Um, the F-ring is on an inclined orbit, so it sticks out of the ring plane. And obviously, if the sun is edge on, you would shine light just on the things above the ring plane, primarily the F-ring. Light is not too good here. Now. There are some brighter structures in here as well that coincide with the ring edges, showing us for the first time that they were vertically extend. Also, we knew about deafness and we knew that it would make structures, it would create a gap, and it could create wakes. But what we did not anticipate was that it, can, uh, that it uh, drives the ring material out of the ring plane by kilometers to cast these giant shadows. This is something we didn't anticipate before. Yet more striking, this is the inner edge of the B, uh, the outer edge of the B ring. You see these few kilometer large structures casting shadows onto the rings. It's materials flashing up, it's currently unexplained. We're seeing all these structures throughout the rings. There's structure formation, there are giant particles forming. And yeah, they can move out of the ring plane and this is the first direct detection of them that we have. Other detections of clumps and larger particles are here made in the F-ring. You see these bright things. You can also do that with our wiggly lines, essentially. We, if you cut, if you're lucky enough to cut across one of these objects, then we would see a dip in the starlight. So we found these. Um, and then, later on, we saw something bright at the outer A-ring edge. This was unanticipated. The outer A-ring edge is also um, showing these kind of shadows and it has texture, it has formation of stuff, but such a giant feature. And the ideas are people are rumoring this could be the birth of a new moon. Is this material forming, clumping at the edge of the moon that will later be just released? Could this be how the inner Saturnian satellites formed where they just spawned out of the ring system? And if you look closer at the airing edge, you see more and more of these smaller clumps. And it's a question, are these just temporary structures or are these aggregates that survive longer and could form something like um, this big structure I showed you before? This is an assortment of the, of the smaller Saturnian moons and Prometheus is one of them, it's a shepherd of the F-ring. So it's just right outside of the A-ring. Um, and the question was with this accretion ridge, it has a core, but it has some kind of ridge on whether it accreted ring material, whether it was spawned from the ring. So the entire question, how did the rings form and um, how did the moons form, are they interrelated, is a very it's exciting thing. <coughs> now we have two more years left in the mission. 2017, the summer solstice, the mission will end. We will uh, burn in the atmosphere of Saturn. This is a trajectory outlay. So we will fly the so-called F-ring orbits, where the spacecraft will just fly outside of the F-ring through the ring plane in these orbits. <coughs> Later, we will have a flyby at Titan that will change our trajectory to bring us in the proximal orbits. And in the proximal orbits, we will actually dive right in between the planet and the inner of the rings. It's a very narrow, unexplored region. We've never been there before. We've never done in situ measurements. We have only estimates of what they call the dust hazard. How many ring part particles are there? Is it a hazard to the spacecraft? So the first times we will fly through this, we will point the high gain antenna face down as a kind of shield to protect us from any potential particle impact. But as we move on, we will have something like 20 orbits before we have finally the impacting one and we will burn up in the atmosphere. Each go through through this region will be about seven seconds until we go around. It's very fast succession. And it's a very exciting time then. So this is just a, an overview. Here you see the flybys that will happen in different orbits, how many orbits. So 2015, we still have Dione and Tethys coming up as a flyby, multiple Titan ones because they are important for the trajectory 
navigation and changes. Um, in 16, we will fly again through the Enceladus plume. We will directly measure the plume particle. CDA will sample the composition again. And this time, it will coincide with the plume's highest activity, which we have never done before. So the plume will be as active as it has not been before. And we'll be right there to, to sample it. We have a few other smaller satellites here. And then in 2017, we have the proximal orbit where we go around. As I said before, this is the first time that we've been in this region. It's very important to find potential radiation belts around Saturn. Um, magnetospheric science, it's a high priority for them. For the rings, of course, because if you fly through so close to the planet, first of all, you can measure the gravity field of the planet much better. You have a lot of trajectories that you can integrate over and that you can calculate the gravity field so you know how Saturn looks like inside the gravity field. However, if you fly also outside the rings and inside the rings, you can know how much the rings do to the gravity and you can eventually measure their mass, which is important if they are lightweight then it's very likely that there was a catastrophic event, a comet that came too close, a moon that wandered in that was shred to pieces. Or if they're very heavy, then it's more likely that they're primordial and potentially have been spawning all these inner icy satellites. So all of these measurements are answering key questions that are still not answered despite being there for such a long time. So you need really targeted observations, unique opportunities, and they're only possible right at the end of this, of this mission. And at the end, I would just like to, let me show you this one. Because you remember when I, when I showed you the comparison that the ring system would fit right in between Earth and the Moon? The rings extend something like 300,000 kilometers. Their vertical extent is typically something like 10 meters or in the tens of meters. And take a football stadium and spread it out on a piece of paper, the thickness of a piece of paper. This is how the rings compare. And this is a movie showing images of the Moon Pan, which is a few kilometers in radius, orbiting in the rings. So you see the rings at the backdrop. And you see the vertical extent, how thin they actually are as this kind of walnut shaped moon orbits. It's very fascinating. Okay. So yeah, I will show you this movie and uh, it kind of highlights what we're expecting in the next years to come, and I'd be happy to take questions after that. Cassini is there in the Saturn system now, has been making discoveries for the last several years, and there's more to come. By studying the satellites in the Saturnian system, we begin to understand something also about the origin of the solar system. There is strong evidence now that most of the surface of Titan is in fact covered with organic material of some kind. We're going to be looking at lakes on the surface of this moon in detail. We're going to be looking at the atmosphere to see how the climate changes over time. We have some global circulation models that tell us if the winds pick up, we think there could be waves on the lakes of liquid methane. Can you imagine anybody thinking that we would discover active cryovolcanism on one of these moons? Geysers? One of the things that we'll do in the next couple of years is make the first ever flyby through the plume when the plume output is at its maximum. And then, of course, there's the planet Saturn itself. As we go through our series of orbits and as the seasons change, it's like having a brand new mission. One Saturn year is nearly 30 Earth years. To be there for nearly half of a Saturn year is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The sun now is coming up on the North Pole, so we're getting to see territory that was in darkness when we first arrived in 2004. Pretty soon we'll have the whole hexagon and the hurricane inside of it illuminated by the sun. And then, of course, the mission's end itself is completely unique. 
starting in 2016, ending in 2017, these orbits will take us up and over the north and south poles of the planet. We're actually going to dive in between the innermost edge of the D-ring and the upper atmosphere of the planet itself. From that, we're going to learn how is Saturn constructed from inside out. We'll also get the magnetic field of the planet, the mass of the rings for the very first time, and get to sample a place that no spacecraft has ever flown before. This is a mission that cannot be duplicated. So we really want to take advantage of this opportunity to observe seasonal variation in the system. In your movie theaters next. Is there any rough estimate of the mass of the rings? Yeah, there is um, the initial understanding and after the Voyager mission. Uh, we estimated that the B ring, the densest part of the rings, would be equal to some of the one minus mass, which is one of the um, inner Saturnian satellites. It would be equivalent to one of the moons. One of the smaller moons. One of the smaller moons, yeah. But current observations and occultations show that um, the structures that we see in the parts of the B ring that sunlight does penetrate through, or the starlight can penetrate, actually indicates a lower mass density less mass per area, which would mean that there's less mass than one minus one. However, it was always believed that the B-ring is a massive object, but we'll know at the end of the mission we'll measure. In that simulation you had, you have up the mm -hmm. more clumpy stuff? Yeah. Is that a moon falling? Could that be a moon falling? Uh, it could be one of the more resistant clumps forming in the outer A-ring, that is, that is true. However, at this point, we are, for instance, not even sure how these moonlets, the propeller objects embedded in the rings, how they have formed. Are they the shreds of, of some catastrophic event that just distributed them, and they are just the shards left behind making their nice structures, or did they actually form in situ? So um, simulations depend a lot on which particle size distribution you use, how sticky you make those particles together, but then again, we don't know exactly what the particles are made of. They are, we know they are. 98% water ice. However, how the surface exactly looks like and how they stick together, that is still in the open. What, what is the data that you hope to get um, as we see burns up um, on the surface? Well, there's, um, at one point, Cassini will not return data anymore, obviously. So we can't measure all the way down <laughs> until we burn. Um, we will measure um, the dust environment in situ. We will measure with the magnetron and the plasma environment, see if there's any radiation belts around. Um, we will do stellar occultations. We will try to make images. But at the speeds that you're so close at the planet, you know, exposure times of the images have to be really short to avoid smear to have a good resolution state. So there's gain and, and lose. Where are you relative to the sun? those last approaches. Maybe is the sun behind the hit spacecraft is on the closest approach or is uh, off the sun? I don't know. You, you, you're orbiting, are you coming in on the closest approach? Yeah. Is the sun behind? I can't say I don't know. You don't know. I don't know whether we're, we're diving in behind into the atmosphere. It's also a question how good our estimates of the atmosphere are. We have all these measurements by now, but how dense is it really and where it will happen. But I don't know on which side the sun would be, so if we were able to see it, let's say if we had a good telescope. Nicole, just, there's just one more um, opportunity to sample the plumes of Enceladus. Um, there, as far as I know, three more flybys of Enceladus. So we would sample and have measurements, but it may be that images are taken and the dust analyzer cannot observe at the same time. Or, but we will have one very good opportunity where we will fly through the plume and sample with the, uh, the plume particles, and it will be when the Enceladus is uh, most active, screwing up most of the moons that you see forming, 
are all being formed in the plane of this, uh, in the single plane. The, the other moons, are they in the, the uh, uh, moons that have already formed, are they all in that plane also? Yes, so same as the solar system, if a planet has its, its left, its disk left from its primordial origin, in the same way that planets formed in the system, um, moons can form. So they will all have the same spin, they will all have the same orbital motion. This is why Fever retrograde is such a... So that's what I'm asking. So, so they're all in, the sa in yes, that same plane. they will plane. all be in the same plane. They're all in the equatorial plane. And that's also the reason why the rings are in the equatorial plane. There are particles, even if you would take a particle out of the ring plane and you would have an orbit of an inclined orbit, it will go so many times through the rings and collide with other particles that the energy would dampen out and would kind of flatten into the same system. Sometime in the future, um, the rings will all be essentially absorbed into uh, the new moon. That is a question. So it is still not exactly proven that <coughs> the icy moons did form on the rings. It could still be that the rings are just charts and they are just collisional there. You see structures that, that hold them in place for a longer time. So it is possible that we could form moons in the rings, but we don't really have it seen. I mean, this, this structure we saw at the outer end. A ring edge, this bright object there, is very promising. It's a very large plumb. I mean, if you see it in such a large image, it's tens of tens of thousands of kilometers wide. So it, it is a denser blob orbit. Whatever will happen to it in the future, will it be more persistent. Will it be able to kind of repel all these other ring particles and try to and the tidal shear to that tries to shred it to pieces? We don't know. This is in general the picture. Way all moons are formed? Um, the moons are formed in disks around the planet, same as the planets around the sun. <laughs> so they, they coalesce, they, are, they, they form larger chunks, and these chunks will multiple times run into each other, essentially forming in yet larger ones. So this is how Titan formed. Um, and they just recollect. The moon also was once spread out in a disk and it kind of reassembled itself together to form one object. They all formed in the distance. Other questions? 